Today, we're going to explore the Lissy family tragedy, a harrowing case that raises questions about what drives a seemingly devoted family man to commit unspeakable acts. It also prompts us to examine the characteristics of psychopathy and how such individuals can blend into society, concealing their true nature until they unleash unimaginable horrors. Psychopathy, a personality disorder characterized by traits like lack of empathy, emotional shallowness, egocentrism, and manipulative charm, can be difficult to detect. Even those closest to a psychopath may not recognize the danger until it's too late. The Lissy family story serves as a stark reminder of this reality. Despite outward appearances of a loving family, tragedy struck, revealing a darker side hidden beneath the surface. The man behind the heinous act shocked everyone with his calculated actions and chilling motives. Yet, psychiatric evaluation confirmed his awareness and premeditation, leaving many baffled and shaken. This case shook Italy, particularly the serene province of Mavizanti, where the tragedy unfolded. It etched itself into the history of the small Milanese suburbs as one of the most notorious crimes. Now, let's delve into the events leading up to this tragic conclusion. In the early hours of Saturday, June 14, 2014, the quiet town of Mavisanti was disrupted by the desperate cries of 31-year-old Carlo Lay, who claimed that his entire family had fallen victim to intruders who had broken into their home. He miraculously survived because he was out with friends at a local sports bar watching the soccer match between Italy and England. Upon returning home, he discovered his house in disarray and the lifeless bodies of his 38-year-old wife, Christina, their five-year-old daughter and their one-and-a-half-year-old son. Neighbours immediately called the police and emergency medical services. While waiting for them to arrive, the operator asked Carlo to check for any signs of life and possibly start CPR if there were any. However, he refused to step inside the house or touch the bodies, even before confirming their demise. Carlo's behaviour, although possibly attributed to shock, raised eyebrows. He struggled to react emotionally with dry eyes and an almost indifferent expression despite attempting to cry. His recollection of events was muddled and his statements conflicted. He claimed to have recorded the discovery of the bodies on his phone's camera, believing it would prove his innocence. However, this recording ended up being a key piece of evidence against him, among others. The robbery narrative initially advocated by Lissy was swiftly dismissed by the police. Instead, he became the prime suspect as more physical evidence was uncovered at the crime scene. Doubts about his mental health began to surface. Now, let's introduce the main characters of this narrative, starting with Christina Lissy. Born Christina Omas on September 17, 1975, in the small northern Italian town of Pavia, she was the eldest child in her family. She exhibited a strong-willed, independent and highly ambitious nature, always marching to the beat of her own drum. Christina possessed leadership qualities and was constantly striving to excel in whatever she undertook, whether it was her schoolwork, performances in the drama club, or any day-to-day -day activities. Thanks to her excellent organisational skills and ability to lead, she always had a wide circle of friends. After finishing high school, Christina was accepted into a prestigious university in Milan and soon moved out of her parents' home to start an independent life. Despite this, she maintained a close relationship with her family, staying in constant touch. Her parents knew they could always rely on their eldest daughter. At the age of 19, while still attending university, Christina took a job at a branch of a major Italian insurance company located in M.A. Visconti. She quickly earned the respect of her superiors and colleagues, and her career was on a fast track to success. Upon graduation, she had a wide array of opportunities before her. Instead of moving to a big city, she chose to stay closer to home in the countryside. By this time, she had already received a promotion at work and assumed a managerial position, becoming a leading specialist in the field of civil insurance. 
However, even as she grew into an adult and a successful woman, Christina never gave up her youthful passion for theatre. She dedicated all her spare time to rehearsals and performing on stage, particularly enjoying musical productions due to her strong voice and impeccable musical ear. In M.A. Visconti, she had her admirers and was sometimes even recognised on the streets. Yet, Christina's personal life didn't seem to fall into place as smoothly. She had many suitors and occasional romances, but most of the men she encountered seemed frivolous, unreliable and unsuitable for a serious relationship or family life. She held on to the belief that she would eventually find her true love and achieve happiness. Carlo Lissi, the unassuming psychopath, entered the world in the fall of 1982 in the Italian commune of Casarano as the eldest of two sons in his family. The family patriarch held conservative views and was quite strict, even harsh, with his children. Carlo's younger brother quickly became the parent's darling, constantly pampered and protected, while they demanded unquestioning obedience, stellar academic performance, and high achievements from their firstborn. From childhood, Carlo strived to meet his parents' expectations, always acting as instructed. He excelled academically, participated in volleyball, a sport his father chose for him despite Carlo's passion for soccer, and never argued with his father, who often stated that his house operated solely on his rules. It was easy to upset or anger their father, who became terrifying when enraged, so Carlo made it a point never to contradict him, always enviously observing his father's and mother's more affectionate treatment towards his younger brother. As a teenager, Carlo became nervous and withdrawn, dreaming of doing something on his own yet fearing his father's wrath. His fears, internal struggles and self-doubt affected his relationships with peers. Carlo had almost no friends at school. He was seen as an uninteresting individual, often openly bullied without the ability to defend himself, as his father had crushed his self-esteem and suppressed any desire to assert himself. Over time, Carlo learned to adapt and blend in, avoiding conflict, trying to merge with the crowd and being superficially polite and kind, even to those he despised. It seemed Carlo had lost his own emotions, or perhaps never had them, laughing or mourning with others, but his emotional responses always remained shallow because he never truly felt those emotions. Another trait of Carlo was his skill in dodging uncomfortable questions. He wasn't a pathological liar, but knew how to prevaricate and evade with such an impassive demeanour that it seemed he was speaking the truth. People who knew Carlo personally later recalled his diminished capacity for empathy. He could be described as callous and indifferent to the troubles and sorrows of others, including those close to him. After finishing school, Lissy enrolled in a prestigious university's economics faculty, chosen by his father despite Carlo's disinterest in economics or working with numbers. His opinion was never sought and he couldn't challenge his father's decision. Thus, Carlo was accustomed to acting against his own interests just to meet others' expectations. Carlo was quite handsome and knew how to use it to his advantage. His youthful sports activities and regular gym visits in adulthood made him even more attractive. Coupled with some charm and superficial charisma, Carlo could be described as a real looker with a dazzling smile and athletic build. People often admired his looks, leading to excessive self-love and clinical narcissism. Lissy easily initiated flings with women, but was incapable of engaging in serious long-term relationships. Firstly, he tried to avoid any responsibility. Secondly, he had no interest in making long-term plans, simply going with the flow. Thirdly, his partners soon realised he was emotionally shallow and devoid of real attachment, leading them often to initiate the breakup. Even after university, the young man continued living with his parents, showing no desire to start an independent life, let alone a family of his own. Meanwhile, he secured a job at a leading IT company in Milan. Carlo earned a good salary and faced broad prospects, but remained dissatisfied with his career, 
However, his parents were overjoyed, and his father seemed proud of his eldest son for the first time. So, Carlo was too afraid to disappoint him, preferring to avoid conflicts and criticism. But soon, a good job and career achievements weren't enough. His parents increasingly pressured him to marry and provide them with grandchildren. Aware of his numerous fleeting affairs and his inability to maintain serious relationships, these discussions often led to arguments at home, as Carlo always tried to avoid confrontations. He assured them he would soon find a wife and start a family. Carlo first laid eyes on Christina during her performance in a musical play on stage, where he was utterly captivated by her powerful charisma and stunning vocal talent. Despite his immediate fascination, he lacked the courage to approach her after the show. However, fate intervened a few weeks later when mutual friends introduced them. At the time of their meeting, Carlo was only 23, while Christina had already turned 30. Despite the significant age difference, they quickly developed a romantic relationship. Christina, who had previously focused mainly on her career, found herself unexpectedly wanting to build a family and have children with Carlo. He was handsome, career-oriented, and intelligent. Christina perceived his hesitancy, dependency, noticeable selfishness, and some emotional coldness as traits that could be mended. She took the initiative in their relationship, with Carlo compliantly following her lead. Just a few months into the relationship, Omas introduced Carlo to her family. Christina's parents, however, were not pleased with her choice. They saw her suitor as frivolous, with Christina's mother describing him as a child in a man's body. She believed her daughter needed a more emotionally mature partner who could be a reliable support, not this immature young man. Christina, however, disagreed and decided to follow her heart, as she always had. Conversely, Carlo's parents were thrilled with his choice. Christina was seen as an adult, wise, self-sufficient and accomplished woman who could take care of herself and their indecisive, somewhat irresponsible son. The head of the family, who was not easily pleased, was particularly delighted, convincing Carlo further that he had made the right decision. About a year after meeting, the young couple moved in together and started actively planning their wedding. Carlo was quiet and compliant, always listening to his fiancée, never contradicting her, and carefully avoiding domestic disputes. Christina made all the decisions while her chosen partner silently supported them. This arrangement suited her perfectly as she was confident that a long and happy life awaited them. However, just before their wedding, Carlo revealed his true nature for the first time. Nearly causing them to split before the wedding, Carlo's friends threw him a bachelor party in one of Milan's popular nightclubs. They drank, had fun, and were having a great time when a group of women joined them. The guy went off to a hotel with the woman where they spent a passionate night. The next morning, unexpectedly, Carlo confessed his love to the casual lover and promised to leave his fiancée for her. That same day, he confessed everything to Christina, stating he had fallen for someone else and no longer wanted the wedding. Christina handled the news with dignity, packed her belongings, and decided to move back to her parents' house temporarily while finding her own place. But when Carlo's father learned about his son's actions and that the engagement with Christina was broken off by his initiative, he was furious. He declared he didn't want to see his heir until he apologised to the bride-to-be and convinced her to marry him again. Once again, Carlo submitted to his father's will. After buying a huge bouquet of flowers, he headed to the Omis's residence. Christina's parents opposed him. They had disliked this peculiar young man even before the news of his infidelity and the broken engagement, and now they certainly didn't want to see him. But the final decision was Christina's to make. After some thought, she decided to forgive her fiancé and give him another chance. The wedding took place as planned, and the money gifted by relatives was invested in buying their own home in M.A. Visanti. Initially, their marital life seemed quite blissful, but both held high-ranking positions with substantial salaries, affording them not just the necessities, but also travel, entertainment and more. 
In 2009, they welcomed their first child, a daughter named Julia, and in 2013, Christina gave birth to a son, Gabriel. To the outside world, they appeared as a happy family, full of love and understanding. Carlos seemed to do everything to please his wife, not out of deep love or respect, but rather to avoid disputes. Christina was content with their life together, oblivious to the double life her husband led. At home, he was the exemplary family man, spending time with his wife and kids. Yet in Milan, where Carlo commuted daily for work, he transformed entirely. He frequently engaged in flings and casual encounters, meeting women in cafes, shopping centres, or even on the street. The handsome, stylishly dressed man in his expensive car almost always received reciprocated interest, but these affairs typically ended after a few dates. Carlo enjoyed the control and dominance in these short-term relationships, deciding when to see his next conquest and when to leave her at home. Christina held the reins, with Carlo merely following her lead. However, rumours of his escapades eventually reached Christina. Each time she confronted him, Carlo swore it was all lies and slander. In 2013, shortly after the birth of their second child, Carlo seriously considered leaving his family for one of his mistresses, to the point of admitting his intentions to his wife. Christina countered with compelling arguments against their separation, particularly highlighting how it would upset his parents. Carlo had no choice but to concede to her reasoning. A year later, in early 2014, a new employee named Maria, young and attractive, joined Carlo's workplace. He fell for her instantly, unable to think of anyone else. He tried everything to catch her attention, giving small gifts, complimenting her, and asking her out repeatedly. However, Maria was clear about not wanting to engage with a married co-worker who had two children. But Carlo, persistent in his pursuit, seemed to ignore her protests and didn't think of giving up. Moreover, Carlo began to blame his family for his unhappiness, believing his wife and children were obstacles to his personal joy. He convinced himself he had never been happy in his marriage or in life for that matter. But with Maria, he imagined he could have the perfect relationship if only he wasn't bound by his marital ties and responsibilities as a father. The more he dwelled on this thought, the darker his contemplations became. Carlo broached the subject of divorce again, but his wife once more convinced him it was a bad idea, and he found no arguments to counter hers. Frustrated, he started looking online for divorce lawyers, but realised after a few consultations that he would have to surrender half of his assets to Christina and also pay child support. Unwilling to accept such an outcome, he began researching how to end a person's life quickly and without arousing suspicion. Delving into various criminal stories, Carlo stumbled upon an article about an armed robbery that had occurred a few years prior in M. Vizanti. The robbers had fatally stabbed the homeowner before fleeing with the loot, remaining undetected to this day. A monstrous plan took shape in Carlo's mind to recreate a similar robbery scenario, but this time the intended victims would be the mother and children. The last day for Christina and the children was Friday, June 13th, 2014. Carlo had the day off and spent it with his family, giving them a farewell party, so to speak. They went to an amusement park together, then went to the mall for shopping and spent the evening at a popular local cafe. The man did his best to make sure that as many people as possible saw him and his family that day and everyone noticed how happy they were. After returning home, the couple put the children to bed in their rooms on the second floor and went downstairs to the living room, where they made love. It was part of Carlo's cunning plan to avert suspicion. He knew that the examination would establish the fact that he and Christina had consensual intimacy, and who would think that after that, a man would suddenly take the life of his wife and children? The woman knew that her husband was going to watch soccer with friends, and assumed that he went to get dressed, and she herself settled down in the living room at the TV. But Carlo, at that time, went to the kitchen, where he took a large knife and stealthily crept up to his wife from behind. He stabbed her in the side of the neck, but Christina not only remained conscious, but also rushed to escape. 
Apparently, she did not immediately realize who had attacked her, and when she turned around and saw her distraught husband with a knife in his hand, she was shocked. The victim tried to defend herself and dislodged the knife, causing the man's hand to slip and injuring his palm. Despite her efforts, the strength disparity was too great. Carlo continued his assault until Christina showed no signs of life. He then went upstairs and cut the throats of his sleeping five-year-old daughter and 18-month-old son. Experts later concluded that the children likely did not suffer and probably didn't even wake up. Neighbours, some of whom heard loud screams, did not call the police, thinking the noise quickly subsided. Carlo clumsily staged a robbery, erasing his fingerprints and cleaning the floor where he had stepped in fresh blood. However, he left blood splatters unnoticed on his clothing. His claim of a robbery was quickly dismissed. Investigation revealed no logical reason for robbers to harm the children. Carlo became the prime suspect and gave inconsistent statements. Evidence, including a bloodied cloth in the trash, pointed to premeditated murder. Despite being labelled a psychopath, Carlo insisted on his innocence. His motive, revealed later, was to avoid divorce settlements with his wife and financial obligations to his children so he could pursue a relationship with another woman. Carlo was sentenced to life in prison in January 2015. He showed no remorse and attempted but later withdrew an appeal. His father, unable to accept his son's actions, died shortly after Carlo's conviction.